Thank you, guys. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks to Dave and company for uh, ushering me in, hosting me so well. I often ask for the slot right before lunch because then I'm all powerful. I'm like what's between the audience and lunch. Uh, and it's, it's fun to play that game, but I think most of us had lunch. Uh, so I guess I'm between you and work, so we should just linger as long as we can in the Q&A. Um, I thought I would just share a little bit about the book, how I came to the story, share a few passages from it, and then get into a Q&A and sort of learn what's on your mind and have a kind of back and forth. So Breaking and Entering is the true story of a female hacker called Alien, and the birth of our information insecurity age. And I should make clear from the onset that Alien is a white hat hacker. She is someone who is paid by big businesses and government agencies to try to break into them in order to see how they can be broken into. Uh, she also does recovery work if someone has already been breached, coming in doing forensics, uh, and other kind of analysis to figure out what happened, how to recover, and why. And she also does a variety of other things, such as digital hostage situations and kind of ransomware cases, for example, where you've got 24 hours to have your hospital system or law firm or tech company uh, get the data that has been compromised back. Uh, and you have to pay $200,000 in Bitcoin. And she kind of answers, is that true? Is there another way to get it out? Uh, if you do want to pay $200,000 in Bitcoin, how do you do that uh, in the next few hours? How do you do that without getting triple infected on the way back? Um, she, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that in the sort of end of my talk as I get to that end of her career. But I want to go back a bit. So um, I guess I want to just get a sense of the room. Uh, is anyone here, or who here is, I know there's a lot of different teams, who here is in security in some way? Okay. So I think I got about 15 or so of you. Um, so that means there's like 30 people in security and 15 are, are, are admitting it. Um, I've, learned, I've learned the math. Um, and I guess on the flip side, is anyone here, I won't make you tell the gory details, is anyone here... Uh, been hacked. Okay, so I, I don't see any hands. So as the 15 people who did raise their hand could tell you, that means like 40 of you have been hacked, I guess. Uh, 10 of you have, you know it, you don't want to admit it, that's okay. And, you know, we can multiply that by four. So then, you know, that's another 40 of you have and I guess just don't know it yet. Um, has anyone ever been targeted uh, by a hacker. Have you ever like gotten an email that might not have been from the person who said it was? There might have been a link if you clicked on it. It was a, a bad idea and they made you all carry some special device from now on to do anything at work. Anyone? Uh, yeah. Has anyone ever got a, I, I got a call on Monday from the help desk. Have you ever, right? Um, or it can be face to face and we'll talk about some circumstances like that too. So that is basically all of us are targeted every day, all the time. And so we're in an interesting situation where hacking is now a field where everyone, not just at Google, but is pretty well aware of it, um, from little kids to great grandmothers. And all of us are targeted, and we know that hackers have an outsized influence on parts of our economy, on our politics, uh, on our culture. But we still, for the most part, if you ask people, what does a hacker look like? They don't have a face. So uh, maybe they pop up a popular search engine. Uh, if you do an image search uh, for hacker, gosh, <laughs> you get literally no faces. Uh, you get shadowed figures in hoodies or occasional Guy Fox masks. But don't worry, you know, I'm sure the fourth search result, no, the fifth, the 20th, the 400th, um, it just goes on and on. Uh, there are no faces uh, to this field, even though it is so integral to 
you know, we're all thinking about it more and more often. It's in the newspaper every day. So as a writer, that's an incredible opportunity, right? Can I tell the story? Can I show the face? Can I show the field growing up? Uh, you wouldn't necessarily know it by the cover of my book. It's not that different. But, you know, I'm wedded to the world that your search engine results have created. And so if I want to signal that it's a book about a hacker, I've got to have a shadowy figure um, with ones and zeros. But inside, I try to put a face on the top. So how did I come to this story? How did I get this chance to kind of follow um, hacking over the last 20 years? Because if you think about it, even when we have a face, that face is like 30, 40 years old at this point. It's like Matthew Broderick in War Games uh, or Angelina Jolie in Hackers. Um, so it's an incredible opportunity. So did I just start following people with hoodies uh, down alleyways until I found someone going into the dark web uh, before the San whatever the FBI could could trap them in a San Francisco public library. Um, I didn't. I found this story through an alternate investigative journalism method. I picked my daughter up from preschool. So I went to pick her up, and there was a new classmate. They were playing together. The girls ran off to the playground. If you ever have, like, five-year-olds, you know that the best babysitter for a five-year-old is a five-year-old. Uh, they kind of cancel each other out, and they, they occupy each other. It's like mutually assured something. Um, so I'm talking to the mom, and she says, um, hey, you know, what, what do you do? And I think oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to be the interesting person in this conversation. <laughs> I'm a writer. I write these books. I write these articles. I talk about myself for 10 minutes. Um, and to be polite, I say, uh, you know, what about you? What, what do you do? And she says, well, tomorrow I have to break into a bank. <laughs> and I realized, oh, <laughs> I'm not the interesting person in this conversation. And that led to a longer series of conversations. And I found out, yeah, there's this whole field that's real uh, and this whole profession that's grown up over the last 20 years, as I described to you at the beginning, of people who are have the same skills as the bad guys and do the same activities in a high-end, professional, organized way, but do it under contract. You pay them big bucks for the privilege of having them try to break into you. And hopefully you get them to do it before uh, you've been broken into already by a more malicious actor. So as I followed her story and heard more about it, I got really excited. Because even in the field of hacking, people tend to specialize. You get car hackers. You get elevator hackers. You get people working in a particular operating system or mobile phone operating system or particular network vulnerability. Um, but Alien had gone through a huge variety of worlds. And her career, if you will, it didn't start as a career, it started as a sort of fun activity, um, had grown up at the same time this profession had. So in following her story, I could follow Hacking's growth from this sort of skateboarding-like subculture to what's now, I think, $140 billion cybersecurity industry. And not just a large and valuable industry, but one that touches every aspect of our lives and gives us insight into every aspect of our lives. So the hope was, if I can follow a hacker in her footsteps, uh, readers can do the same. And you don't it's not just what you know reading about it uh, or learning about it. It's also you'll experience it yourself and kind of understand our vulnerabilities or our capabilities in a new way. So I want to share uh, a few passages to illustrate some of the breadth of her world. Uh, one I won't share just for time reasons is the beginning. Uh, she started as a 17-year-old at MIT. Do we have any MIT grads here? You got at least one. Uh, two. Yeah, anyone do uh, course 19? I got a smile and I got a puzzled look. So at MIT, majors are called courses. So what? What was just? What was the name? Your number? What was the? No, no, what was your course? 18. Course eighteen, which is what? Math. Course eighteen, math. What was your course? Six three. Course six three, which was computer science. computer science. Okay. So they're numbered and they go up to like twenty four. Nineteen is not an assigned number. There is no designated 
Course 19. But unofficially, Course 19 is hacking. And hacking at MIT predates computers. It does not directly refer to computers at all. It refers to physical exploration. So I was familiar with part of this tradition. There's this tradition of elaborate, ingenious physical pranks, like getting a police car on top of the dome at MIT, uh, or having a complete living room set, couch, you know, um, liquor cabinet, even a cat, a newspaper, uh, upside down uh, on the uh, arch outside the media lab at MIT, or a working Tetris game that's playable on the windows of the tallest building on campus. And I was familiar with these hacks, but I wasn't I didn't think about the foundational skills needed to do that. You don't just kind of get up at, you know, noon or eight or you know nine at night and say to your buddies, "Hey, we should put a police car on the dome." Maybe you do that, but you're not going to pull it off. You've got to be able to pick locks, sneak past security guards, climb on ledges, disassemble and assemble a car. You've got to be able to do that in the dark. You've got to be able to do that with a small group of people you can really trust to keep a secret, and you've got to be able to get in and out. Uh, and the same thing with the Tetris game, the same thing with the living room set, the same thing with all these other hacks. And there is pulling a, a hack is the, what I just described, but going hacking is totally different. You're exploring uh, for the sake of exploring. You're going through steam tunnels. You're going along ledges. You're climbing up elevator shafts. You're finding hidden or unused spaces inside of the buildings that everyone else takes for granted and sort of goes through as a, a normal civilian. And that's exciting. It's perilous. Um, and it has this direct analog to computer hacking, you know, where you're also getting into forbidden spaces. You're also um, working off-label with what somebody else has created. If an inventor creates something new and an engineer builds to spec, a hacker creates something new with something someone else has built to spec. Um, so you're often knowing spaces in a way that the creator themselves didn't. And that's a direct analog to computer hacking we know today. She goes from that world into computer security as it's becoming a new field. And I thought I'd read a short passage from a section where she is working in information security. It's about 2005 in a hospital system, one of the largest hospitals in the country. We're aware, especially now, uh, that everything that is a computer can be hacked and that everything is a computer. But it still is different to know that uh, and to experience it firsthand. So, for example, in a hospital, you're connected on average when you're in a hospital bed to about 11 different medical devices. Those have a network card usually. Those have an operating system. It's usually built on Windows. Uh, maybe a little more Unix in the past. Hey, maybe uh, Chrome or uh, you know stuff right now. And that means it's going to have the same vulnerabilities that those systems have. Hospital equipment is also often bought on a 15 to 20 year time cycle because it's millions of dollars. And so that means when you go to the hospital in 2019, you may be experiencing uh, systems that are serving you that have the vulnerabilities of 2004 or 1999. Uh, but don't worry, we will have the security we have today uh, in just 15 to 20 years. Uh, so your grandchildren will uh, have the secure systems. Uh, so looking at trying to protect that and what that looks like was really interesting in trying to recreate that through her experiences going on site, talking to her old bosses and colleagues. And I thought I'd share a bit from that. So what happens is um, she gets a call from the network team at the hospital. And they're having a bandwidth issue. Something is uh, clogging the network. And so devices aren't able to communicate. And some of them are shutting off. And that's a crisis in a situation where the flow of data is literally a matter of life and death. And people need to be able to contact each other across wards, transfer information, and the devices themselves are life-saving. She goes to the office of her colleague, Amy, on the network team. Amy was a lanky brunette, 27 or 28, dressed in jeans and a teal pullover. 
Ilya knelt beside her in her cubicle as they studied network traffic information from internet addresses across the hospital. We started getting calls two or three hours ago saying the internet was slow, Amy told her. I checked it out and they're right. Some internal address is just spewing traffic. It's got to be a worm, Alien said. Can you shut off the port? I could, but I don't know what's plugged into it, Amy said. What if it's an important machine? I don't want to just cut it off. Let me see, Alien said. She stepped up to the keyboard and scrolled back through Amy's command history, double-checking her investigation. Amy was a pro, though. On the basis of the internet address alone, the closest they could do was trace the worm's origin point to a third-floor hallway in the same building that held the ER. Alien's eyes narrowed. Stay here. I'll find it, she said. Alien ran to the elevator, popped outside, and cut diagonally across the campus. Seven minutes later, wide sliding doors separated for her at the entrance to the ER. Amy had called ahead for backup. An IT staffer assigned to this building met Alien at the third floor hallway and showed her to the right network switch. It serviced a long, quiet hallway. By now, Alien had burned almost half an hour, but she was getting closer. Back out on the hallway, Alien stopped in front of the only door in sight. Doctors and nurses swished past. Alien stepped back, feeling out of place without a white coat or scrubs. When a nurse slowed before the door, however, Alien flagged her down. Hi, I'm from IT security, she said, and showed her badge. I need to get in here. Oh, the nurse swiped her own badge and the door clicked open. I'll have to accompany you, she warned. This is a restricted area. The room was warm and dark. Alien could make out a few rows of what appeared to be high, narrow carts on wheels, each with a monitor nearby. It was vaguely reminiscent of a server room, but her entire concern was with the network ports located close to the floor. Alien dropped to a crawl. Using the same mag light she'd had since her freshman year at MIT, she swept the walls looking for the guilty port. 20 seconds passed. 40, 60. Finally, Alien's beam illuminated a yellow plastic port cover to which someone with a label maker had attached the alphanumeric name of the infected machine. Alien smiled in triumph and relief. She used the mag light to trace the black ethernet cord coming out of the port. It led to a profusion of other plugs and cables entering the back of the machine closest to her. She'd page Amy and Amy would alert their bosses. They'd get the problem diagnosed as soon as possible, before the machine infected anything further. Alien stood up. She felt the nurse touching her back gently to get her attention without speaking. Turn that flashlight off, please, she asked in a low but firm whisper. It was more a command than a request. Alien obeyed. She felt a sense of alarm, even dread. Had she done something wrong? Where were they? There weren't any patients in this room, she had thought. It had no beds, only more machines like this one. Her senses suddenly heightened, however. She now heard the sound of slow breathing all around her. For the first time since her eyes became accustomed to the dark, Alien took a look around the room. On each of the wheeled stands was a teeny pallet enclosed by clear plastic. The pallets she saw now held teeny blankets and under each blanket was a baby, a teeny one sprawled out on its back and head turned to one side, all wired up. These newborns were essentially on life support and fast asleep. The room might resemble a server room, Alien realized, but it wasn't. It was the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit. Babies, she said to herself. So, Experiences like that are eye-opening because you realize, uh, you know, the virus, the worm, the other vulnerability can be a life support system uh, for, you know, a cluster of kids. That's not a port you want to pull uh, right away. From her work in security, she moves to kind of the other side of the fence. And this was fun for me because it was the intersection of these two worlds, this physical breaking and entering she had done 
as an undergraduate and the computer security work. She gets hired as a penetration tester or pen tester, uh, testing security uh, at Fortune 500 companies, government agencies around the country and around the world. And I thought I'd share a short passage from uh, her first day at work. We can all just think about what our first day of work was or our first day of work at this campus. Uh, the kind of onboarding process, what was the first task you had to do, the kind of nervousness there, and then think about this as your first day of work in a, in a sort of new opportunity. Ted Roberts, Castle Bank's head of security, requested a private booth at the hotel restaurant. A friendly, blonde, 40-year-old man in a business suit, he leaned across the table after dinner and passed both Richard and Alien his business card and assigned one page note. Alien skimmed the document which she had written and sent to Ted, asking him to fill in the blanks and bring it to their meeting tonight. Castle Bank has hired Elite Defense to perform physical security penetration tests and assessments of nine sites in three states, it said. Specific addresses followed, starting here with the bank's regional headquarters and four branches she and Richard had driven by today doing local reconnaissance. For the rest of the week, Ted's note authorized, they were to probe the facilities one by one to determine if an uninvited visitor could enter, explore, remove equipment or data, or rob the banks. The letter closed with instructions on how to contact Ted if they got caught. Your get out of jail free letter, he said. Richard harumphed, but Alien gave her best smile, folding the letter and placing it in her coat pocket. Thanks, she said, patting the pocket afterward. I hope we won't need it. Ted signaled to a waiter for the check. Good luck, but not too much luck, he said. Tuesday noon, the clock tolled and office workers exited the 20-story headquarters. Everyone was bundled up and breathing out steam on their way to lunch. Moving in the opposite direction, Richard entered the lobby to check it out. Alien watched from the front passenger seat of the car, clutching an empty black laptop case. No, not completely empty. While she waited, Alien reached her fingers into the zippered pocket and checked. There they were, beside her get-out-of-jail-free letter, fake business cards she'd printed after dinner with Ted last night. Elizabeth Tessman, Enterprise Technology Specialist, they said, right of the red Castle Bank logo, above her real cell phone number, a fake Castle corporate email address, and the address of this building, each element copied from Ted's business card. Alien sighed, shifting impatiently. Then she sat up quickly, seeing Richard approach the car. Did you get in, Alien asked, after he had taken his seat and shut the door? Richard responded scornfully. There's no way, he reported. What do you mean, she said. All they've done was try the lobby. What about the freight elevator or the storage room with the open window? What happened? Forget it. Richard turned up the heater and made to shift the car into drive. It's freezing, he said. Let's move. We can totally do this. Alien unbuckled her seatbelt. Let me try, she said. Richard shook his head. You won't get in, he insisted. There are turnstiles and a security guard watching everything. You'll just blow our cover. He continued gruffly, let's try the bank branches first. If there's time, we'll come back here. We found plenty already. We're here now, said Alien, and I won't blow our cover. Richard could spot a narrow opening in a fence at 50 yards and recite security camera specs from memory. Forthright, credible, and confident, he was, like all of her bosses, terrific at presentations. It was clear, however, that he had neither the patience nor the aptitude for what those in the InfoSec community called social engineering. Bluntly put, the term meant manipulating people. You might call it charming them, or in some cases scaring them, but it was always about getting them to do what you wanted. Whoever you were, the trick was to assess the other person and figure out how to, you might talk him or her into something. Perhaps the best name for it might be human hacking. Freshman year, for example, getting Alex and Vlad to help Alien with her calculus homework had been social engineering. More recently, she had turned her dinner out with the bosses into a kind of job interview. Consciously or not, 
every child or parent, teacher or military leader, politician or player on the dating scene use social engineering. For pen testers or their criminal counterparts, like those who sent phishing emails or persuaded victims to empty their bank accounts, the appeal was obvious. Why bother breaking into anything when you could get individuals to open their doors for you? And because people, especially men, were generally less suspicious of women in this kind of situation, being female could be an advantage. It'll be fine, Alien smiled sweetly. I'll be quick and come right back if there's any problem. Before Richard could say another word, she was out the door with her laptop case. Alien crossed the gray slate floor of the spacious lobby. Four hip-high stainless steel gateways stood between her and the elevators. Each was equipped with a wedge-shaped black barrier that receded when you placed your badge on a scanner. Then, as soon as anyone passed the gateway, the barrier closed immediately, preventing tailgating. Next to the gates was a wide marble counter, also gray, behind which stood a white-haired guard in a crisp black uniform, including a matching tie. She walked toward the badge reader system, as though expecting to go through. When the barrier stopped her, Alien acted startled, purposely trying to catch the guard's eye. Then she approached him. Hi, she said. I'm with IT. We have a computer emergency on the seventh floor. I need to get up there. She would be happy to get in anywhere, but knew from remote reconnaissance that this was the floor with the most day-to-day -day office workers. Up close, the man looked even older than she had originally estimated. At least 65 alien guests with thin, gold-framed bifocals and permanent creases in his forehead. Still, he looked in excellent shape, erect and alert. You have to use your badge, the guard said. Or are I in the list? He asked, pointing to a black hardcover binder on the table. No. I'm in IT, Alien told him, reassuming an old role. I'm new. I just started yesterday. The guard frowned. Where's your badge, he asked. I don't have a badge yet, said Alien smoothly, but my name is Elizabeth Tessman, and my boss is Ted Roberts, T-E-D-R-O-B-E-R-T-S. Here's his card. She lifted her laptop case and placed it squarely on the counter between them. She tugged the zipper and took out and slid him one of her new cards as well as Ted's. The guard entered both names in his computer system. He's in here, he acknowledged. You need to call him to get added to the list. Aileen opened her phone, pretending to call Ted and leave a message. As she did so, holding the phone against her ear with her shoulders, she undid the buttons of her trench coat. Hi, Mr. Roberts, she said. This is Elizabeth. I'm leaving you a voicemail. I'm really sorry to bother you. They won't let me up to the seventh floor. I know it's an emergency. Can you call me back, please? I'm really sorry. Thanks. She stood awkwardly in front of the desk, checking her phone and looking fleetingly at the elevators. The guard cringed. I can try him again, she said to him. I'm really sorry to keep you waiting. I know there was a big server crash right before I left. He might be in the data center. I just can't leave without fixing this. I promised. The guard was clearly conflicted. He looked down, giving her card only a second's glance. Then, though, he waved her forward. Look, I know it's important, he said. I'll make an exception. Just be quick. Thanks, I will, she told him, just as she had Richard. Aileen grabbed her laptop bag and stepped forward to the closest gateway. The guard pushed a button under the counter. The barriers parted with a whoosh. Aileen was surprised to feel her heart pounding as she stepped out of the elevator. She'd taken much greater physical risks in college, but she'd never tried to steal something. For now, at least, there was nobody else on this floor. Alien moved quickly. Most workspaces she saw were cubicles containing white desks separated by six-foot freestanding gray walls. At the perimeter of the floor were the larger individual offices of middle-level managers with glass walls and doors. Occupants of the cubicles personalized their space with photos and trinkets, on every desk was a black phone and a Dell laptop connected to an external keyboard and monitor. Alien hefted a few laptops. All were secured with cables. She decided to try the manager's spaces, starting with a corner office with an unimpeded view of the downtown. It had the same computer setup, though on a larger gray desk. She lifted the laptop. No cable. Alien heard the elevator ding, announcing the return of the first of the employees from lunch. Two men chatted as they went to their desks, not noticing her. 
She slipped out of the corner office with the laptop and walked past two more employees. Alien was positive she looked as guilty as she felt, but these employees ignored her too. Her heart was beating harder than ever. To a bank, nothing meant more than its reputation for trustworthiness. The machine might have confidential customer files on it, castle business plans, corporate personnel records, or all of the above. An identity theft ring exploiting that information could make millions. So could shady stock market traders or any of Castle's national and international competitors. And the fines and settlement fees, once a big breach was disclosed, could run to eight figures. Choice Point, the commercial data broker, had paid $15 million the previous year for giving up information on 163,000 people. Alien walked to the elevator as confidently as she could, smiling professionally at others as their paths crossed. Everyone else wore a rigid badge with their name, headshot, and the castle logo clipped to their shirt or waistband, so she shielded those areas with the laptop case. The elevator opened back in the lobby. Did you get it taken care of? The security guard asked. Yes, thanks so much, said Alien, giving him a thumbs up. She crossed the street, opened the car door, and slipped back inside the Taurus. Nada, Richard said in a told you so tone. I did it, Alien said. She zipped open the case. I got a laptop. What? Richard's eyebrows rose as he beheld her prize. Holy shit, he said. So they call that uh, M&M security. It's hard on the outside, soft in the middle once you get past the outer defenses. There's a lot of uh, good stuff to take. I talked to a, a penetration tester who was one of her colleagues for a while. You want to guess what his specialty was? Social engineering. Social engineering is the way in, but then what does he, what does he specialize in? Shred bins. He's like, shred bins are the greatest. They take all of their most confidential information. They put it in one place, and then they put it on wheels. Uh, <laughs> I was like, nobody ever caught you? He said, well, you know, once I was wheeling one out and a guard stopped me and I froze. And he said, hey, what are you doing? And I just raised my hands and he said, that goes down in the freight elevator. Uh, so um, definitely made me look a little differently at shred days at my bank, uh, things like that. So you start looking at things differently hanging out with these hackers. Anyway, you rob a laptop from corporate headquarters on day one. You get promoted pretty quickly if that's your new job. She's soon talking her way into bank vaults themselves and doing computer stuff from like internet cafes, getting into an airline reservation system, doing recovery for a breached government, you know, taking a sort of antennae on the highway outside of a major defense manufacturer and, you know, sort of whisper, sucking their data onto her computer uh, and so on and so forth. Eventually, she starts her own company, and sort of not on purpose so much, but as this industry grows up and becomes a bigger and bigger field, takes on new employees, and becomes a manager, and then a CEO, and she has this sort of new generation of hackers uh, that she's sort of trained and, and brought up under her wing. And that leads to different pressures and different sort of perspective, like when you give birth and you have to debug a phishing site the same day from the hospital, uh, so that was, again, sort of parts of hacker storytelling I hadn't seen before. I thought I'd just end the reading part with a couple real short passages uh, from closer to the end uh, from her kind of CEO days. Alien pa uh, sorry, Luke, Gus, Cheryl, and two new pen testers gathered around the break table discussing their latest work with client 0666, a vast retail chain that needed remote and on-site penetration tests, mobile and web app assessments, and a security review of its credit card processing systems. Who's on site now? asked Alien. Milo, Gus answered. He cracked their wireless network from a cafe inside one of their stores and then wormed his way into the company's central systems. He got root on the badge printing system, said Cheryl. He could add his name and photograph to the badge system and give himself access to any building, any room, you name it. One of the new pen testers piped up. We found this internal database that had the entire shopping history of every single customer. Every customer, asked Alien. 
She shopped at 666. Everybody did. Gus hemmed. Cheryl tittered. What? said Alien. We found you, Cheryl said. <laughs> the earliest entry was from 1993. Ancient history to the 24-year-old. Congratulations. Alien opened the fridge and grabbed a water bottle. She pictured the entire break room papered with her life story as told through 666 receipts from her first bra to her daughter's crib. Last one. In mid-September, Treeline Bank called TSC, it's the pseudonym I use for her hacking company, on behalf of one of its customers, a construction company based in Salt Lake City. A day earlier, the company's payroll manager had clicked on a phishing email link that infected his web browser with a man-in-the-middle attack, allowing hackers to see everything he typed and even replace his familiar Treeline online banking page with an exact replica, asking for additional credentials. Only a second layer of security requiring special executive approval for large wire transfers had stopped the firm from losing almost $60,000 to an offshore account. Could TSC investigate and find out what had happened and how to fix it? Susanna, that's her COO, sent Luke on site to image any affected computers and interview staff. When he returned, Milo took over, using the equipment in the forensics lab to inspect everything carefully. The payroll manager had clicked on 19 links in as many different phishing emails, he discovered. Alien volunteered to help finish the job. I'll do the malware analysis, she said. To understand how the malware worked, Alien set it up in a sandbox or cordoned off virtual machine environment. This gave her the digital equivalent of a high-level biosafety lab where the software could be safely stored, inspected, and dissected. Alien started by viewing the page source for the emailed link that led to the man-in-the-middle attack. It was neatly written by sophisticated programmers. These bad guys are good. Of late, the best black hats had emulated successful Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, licensing the use of their work through cloud-based commercial software suites called exploit kits. To begin a mass attack, you didn't have to know how to write a computer program or even have your own computer. You just logged in from anywhere, chose the kind of hacks you wanted, and paid by the day, month, or year. Some black hat services accepted payment by, deduct by deducting a percentage of the take. Alien infected the virtual machine and then came back 48 hours later to check what the digital thieves had been doing. The software began by configuring itself to run at startup. Then it phoned home once every 20 minutes, seeking updates or further instructions from one of a series of modern command and control servers around the world. What do you want me to do, the program asked in essence. And the criminals at the other end of the connection could order whatever they wanted. It's impressive, she told Susanna afterward, and more than a little frightening, not just in itself, but for what it portended. This wasn't a solo hit-and-run operator. It was the work of a group of professional hackers, just like TSC. As she had gone from novice to student, student to practitioner, practitioner to teacher, and manage to manager, all as a white hat hacker, black hat hackers across the globe had followed a parallel path organizing their operations, establishing reputations, and finding clients, and bringing in money to their communities. Alien had never realized it, and she had never wished for it, but one could even say she had needed the black hats to keep growing and getting new opportunities herself. How many employees do you think they have? Alien asked. I don't know, Susanna said, but their sales team is definitely bigger than ours. <laughs> Alien laughed. From Susanna's desk, she picked up a little statue she had given her. I wonder, maybe, on the other side of the world, if there's an evil Susanna. Susanna raised an eyebrow wryly. Well, then there would have to be an evil alien, too. Thank you, guys. So that's a kind of a taste of some of the scope and the stories and the kind of evolution in the field and in her life, trying to 
use the storytelling style to kind of express that. Um, I'd love to uh, answer any questions you have about either the writing process or other stories from the book or other topics that are of interest to you or uh, teach me something that's uh, keeping you up at night today, uh, security folks or, or any other folks. Uh, and I'll pass it on to the next talk. Um, comment on what's unique or different or interesting in particular. <laughs> uh, about, yeah, uh, her experiences as, as a, a woman in this field. So, yeah, I mean, she gets that job breaking into banks by taking a security class. And the instructor there is one of the leaders of you know, a major pen testing operation. And when she goes into that class, it is herself, and there are 19 guys. And so that's a very different experience. And people, when they start the contest at the end of that class, which is sort of a hacking contest, uh, the guys kind of shove her aside, and she, in that situation, at the beginning, shoves herself aside, or at least lets them take the lead. She's used to being outnumbered, and she's used to being at MIT, where, as she put it, you know, guys were taking apart, heli building helicopters with their dad when they were four. You know, everyone was like 15 years ahead of me when I was a freshman. So she doesn't think of herself as more technically adept. But what she finds is her chops have been built up over the time. She had a boss between those two things at Los Alamos National Laboratory who would not let her work, start working for him until she could do everything without her hands ever leaving the keyboard. And so she knew how to code. She knew you know, command line. But she didn't know how to you know, play a keyboard like a guitar. You know, it wasn't, and that level of extension where you know, the computer is basically an extension of your body she was watching her classmates who kind of nudged her aside at that contest sort of stumble. They kind of wanted a graphical user interface. They just weren't quite as adept. They didn't have the experience she had had at the hospital. And so eventually she sort of starts doing it on her own. And little by little, the guys start lining up behind her. Um, and her fingers are flying. And she's owning system after system. And for her, that was a transformational moment, not because that was when she got the skills, but that's when she realized that she had had the skills. Because um, you have that sort of image of yourself as a freshman or a kid, often that's based in an insecure moment. And then here's a moment of realizing, I can do this. And, you know, that sort of sexism or exclusion, or at least being a minority, continues in a lot of different parts of her career. Um, but, you know, she has to, in conversations, she says the default, when she finally does get a job interview after that, the default is, if a guy's talking, the other guys assume that he knows what he's talking about until he proves otherwise. They assume the opposite in her situation. So she's like, I have to sort of drop more technical references early on to sort of establish my chops. Um, you know, at least for a time she had a, well, yeah, anyway, you know, it's important to talk about Emacs earlier uh, in the conversation uh, when you're a female hacker, I'm told. So, um, you know, at the same time, as I said, there are fields even within hacking, particularly where you're playing with people's expectations, where that can be an advantage. Sometimes you want to be the innocent figure that they don't suspect is going to be an adversary. Other times, she got like a $2 clipboard, and she was the authority figure. You put on a suit and a $2 clipboard, and suddenly you start questioning people. And they kind of like, let me see your, you know, you go to the guard, you're like, I'm doing a spot check. Can I see your badge? Can you show me? I want to check this, the locks on this whole building. And soon you're in the bank vault. So you can flip roles too. Um, so, and then there's experiences that obviously there's no escaping. They're gendered, like giving birth, being pregnant. Uh, these are experiences only a woman can have at this point in our technological life, at least. Um, and, you know, doing that while being a CEO, while being a hacker is to me, another extension of her badassery uh, and women's badassery, if you will. So um, it was cool to see that uh, evolution and also sort of mentoring women and men. You know, there are some, some differences, but that's in the book too. Yeah? Uh, are you able to say what year she was at MIT? Yeah, uh, 1998 to 2003. 
did I assume any personal habits that I changed in the course of writing this book? So kind of two categories. One, I started doing crazy stuff because I was hanging out with hackers and trying to report and understand their experience. So I don't know, how many of you have gone to like DEF CON or any of those black hat, those kind of conventions? Yeah. So as you know, there's like 25,000 hackers in Vegas for the weekend. And you just kind of see where the spirit takes you in those things. And I ended up in a shooting range that they had set up uh, like 30 minutes out in the unincorporated land in the Vegas desert. And there's like drone driven skeet. People are firing cannons they made themselves. Uh, I was like, where, you know, I've come a long way uh, from home. I also climbed up on the domes at MIT and the ledges and did that kind of stuff. And I got a tour through Los Alamos National Laboratory, which is crazy, right? It's like you're walking through the Grand Canyon, you take a right, and there's MIT guarded by people with machine guns. So, um, you know, those were exciting. And as for my own personal habits, sure, I started using email encryption. I started using full disk encryption. Um, I was honestly more careful what I Googled because I was like, somebody's knowing what I'm piping in one way or another. Uh, and I have certain, you know, agreements of confidentiality to change identifying details. But, you know, you guys are going to know or, you know, your machines are going to know whatever I type in. Uh, and... I left my phone, uh, you know, when I took walks. If I didn't need it, why be tracked? Uh, you have a story like that where the retailer has the shopping history. We've all, I'm just going to make a, a guess, 90% of us have shopped at, six, you know, 666. Uh, and, you know, you realize that's not an isolated thing. We, we all shop, period. And everywhere we go, that stuff is stored. And it's stored, data is forever. So, you know, that kind of made me think about situations where I wanted to pay cash, not necessarily out of paranoia, but just out of intentionality, if you will, um, and sort of thinking about the price of convenience and certain obliviousness. And certainly things like smart fridges and doorbells are pretty terrifying uh, to me after hanging out in the you know, Internet of Things village uh, at DEF CON for a while. You are welcome. So I th that's our time. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So I wanted to say, I don't know if I've lost my, my slides. We may have, I may have uh, gone without them too long. Say that again. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, I think, let's see. I wanted to show you guys one more thing. Um, just as a sort of example of the form, uh, I don't know if any of you guys know uh, a hacker named Deviant uh, in the Seattle community. He's uh, great organizer with Tool, the o open organization of lock pickers, and he was a source uh, for and a guide for some of this material. And he designed a hacker bookmark uh, for me and for the book. Uh, so it's a it's a little bit different material than a normal bookmark. It's a kind of uh, flexible plastic. On the back, you can see this bookmark opens doors, and it's got instructions on how to use it for you know certain kinds of lock picking or physical entry a lot like Alien and her classmates did at MIT. Uh, we've got a few of these signed by me and by Alien for those, if anyone's interested, if you get uh, more than one copy of the book, uh, then that's a kind of bonus item. So uh, think about that while supplies last. Um, and I'll, even if they're go, play with, play with one too, just to kind of get a sense of it. Um, there's YouTube videos of him using it to get all sorts of places. Um, so yeah, happy to talk more one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you so much for your time, and um, keep us safe and safer. <laughs> Thanks.